Kai, this is Tanya from South Africa, and today is my fifth episode. And uh, today we're going to look at the Freemasons, um, just a bit of background on the Freemasons. The reason why I'm doing this is because um, it recently came to my knowledge that there were so many uh, of the Boer leaders from 1900s, just before the Boer War, that was involved in Freemasonry. And I started thinking about the idea that why hasn't there been for over a hundred years any clue that can lead to a fact in finding this uh, missing treasure? So let's investigate the Freemasons and see what we can find. Okay, first um, we're going to look at the five points of fellowship. However, I'm just going to share two with you that's standing out for me. Um, the five points of fellowship were thus illustrated in the lecturers used by the Athelmasons of the last century. When the necessities of a brother call for my support, I will be ever ready to lend him a helping hand to save him from sinking, if I find him worthy thereof. A brother's secret delivered to me as such, I will keep as I would my own, because if I betray the trust which has been reposed in me, I might do him an irre uh, irreparable injury, irreparable injury. It would be like the villainy of an assassin who lurks in darkness to stab his adversary when unnamed, unarmed, and least prepared to meet an enemy. Okay, now we're going to have a look at the oath uh, from one brother to another. What does it mean to be a Masonic brother? The idea of Masonic brotherhood probably descends from the 16th century legal definition of a brother as one who has taken an oath of mutual support to another. Accordingly, Masons swear at each degree to keep the contents of that degree secret and to support and protect their brethren unless they have broken the law. Okay, now we're going to have a look at some of the Masonic signs and symbols. First, uh, this is the, the feet. Um, they use these positions when standing when they want another a fellow Mason to identify them. So there's a, a different um, way of standing for the different grades um, or degrees. So there you can say the inter apprentice, it's the first degree, the fellow craft is the second degree, and the master mason, which is the third degree. All right, um, this is just some of the hand uh, shakes, which they also use. So basically, um, the difference, all the shakes look pretty much the same. The only difference is the way where they press with the thumb. So for in the first degree, they will press on the first knuckle. In the second degree, um, they will press um, the first and second knuckle joint, uh, the space where the first and second knuckle joint. On the next degree, they will press on the third knuckle and so on. So this is just to see to identify you and then they can also know in which degree you are. Okay, there is a way that you can identify. Usually you will see this on pictures most of the times. Um, so they will stand with the hand inside, you know, like hidden and or they will stand with some kind of a stick like this. And there's also like a different sign for different degrees. I only use these two examples now because this is going to be relevant in my following episodes. Okay, then um, <clears throat> this is just another familiar one that they use. Um, also, you will see this in pictures very often. And this is another one that you'll see in pictures that will either stand with um, um, a hand on a, a book or a, 
on their Bible or they will have something in the hand, the object, whatever. Sometimes they will just stand with the hand on the table that um, uh, indicates that reflects the, the position with holding the Bible. Okay, there's another one where he's just having the hammer in his hand on the table. Okay, now the following symbols and signs that I'm going to show you is usually um, used on, on grave sites. So the first one I want to show you is the, this one, <clears throat> two pillars. Um, so each one stands for something. I will explain now, but usually you will see this on a grave site, on the two sides of the, of the grave. Um, All right, so the meaning is um, in the course of the pillar crop to greet the candidate passes between the two pillars on his symbolic way into the middle chamber of Solomon's temple. Individually, they represent strength and establishment. And of course, each pillar has got a name. Uh, the one is Bawas and the other one is Rashi. Then uh, another one that you will see is Let's look at this one. Um, any sign that represents a beehive, you will always, uh, you will sometimes find this also on the grave sites. Um, and then beehive meaning, um, <clears throat> it's an emblem of industry and recommends the practice of that virtue to all created beings from the highest sir syrups in heaven to the lowest reptile of the dust. It teaches us that as we come into the world, rash, rational and intelligent beings, so we should ever be industrious ones, never sitting down, contented while our fellow creatures around us are in want, when it is in our power to relieve them without inconvenience to ourselves. When we take a survey of nature, we view man in his infancy, more helpless and in, indigent um, than the brute creation. He lies lang languishing for days, months, and years, certainly incapable of pro providing sustenance, sustenance for himself, of guarding against the attack of the wild beast of the forest, or sheltering himself from the inclemencies of the weather. It might have pleased the great creator of heaven and earth to have made man independent of all other beings, but as dependence is one of the strongest bonds of society, Mankind were made dependent on each other for protection and security, as they thereby enjoy better opportunities of fulfilling the duties of reciprocal love and friendship. Thus was man formed for social and active life, the noblest part of the work of God, and he that will so demean himself as not to be endeavoring to add to the common stock of knowledge and understanding may be deemed a drone in the heart of nature, a useless member of society and unworthy of our protection as masons. Okay, and then the last one is just um, the crown picture. So very often you will see um, it's in different shapes, but usually it's like a triangle kind of with sun beams coming through. So this is a sample of um, a sonic um, Temple somewhere in England, I think. All right, now we're going to have a look at <clears throat> the Freemason Lodge, the first one that was established in Transvaal, I mean in, in Pretoria, Gauteng area. The first English lodge to be Charted in the Transvaal in 1887 was the Transvaal Lodge number 1747, which was based in Pretoria in May 1890. Johannesburg Lodge number 2313 was the first English lodge to be formed on the Witwatersrand. Okay. Just an interesting article on the um, Transvaal Lodge. 
Uh, so I'm just going to highlight some things. There was a meeting um, in Pretoria Masonic Center, Yevska Avenue. Um, and um, the Transvaal had difficulty in protecting its borders from the Zulus. Um, Raiding parties and reluctantly agreed to the governor of Natal annexing the Transvaal in the name of the Great Britain and bringing in forces to aid in its defense. Early in the following year, seven Masons, including one past master, met in Pretoria and within a week had forwarded a petition to Grant Lodge for the establishment of the Transvaal Lodge. The petition was granted, but with the nearest district in Natal, no formal <clears throat> consecration could be carried out. So on 13 June 1878, a past master of the Aurora Lodge, Netherlands, uh, Peter Kirsten, installed John Keith as the first master of Transvaal Lodge. So Tila Stepson was among those present. Within a year of the membership had increased from 9 to 42, and the lodge had its own premises on the corner of St. Andrews and Penelan Streets. But in 1880, as a result of the satisfaction of the Boer community with the British administration, the burghers sought the restoration of the Republic and in the earlier besieged the garrison in Pretoria. So the military took possession of the lodge building and turned it into a fort. But Masonry did not come to a complete standstill as the commanding officer agreed to a daytime meeting being held, provided that all attending were fully armed and carried 70 rounds of ammunition. The meeting is more fully described in chapter 19. After the 104 day siege, the Transvaal was given self governance and the administration was handed over to Paul Kruger. Yeah, so this was just interesting to see how they operated basically while a war was going on. <clears throat> okay, and I'm just going to share with you Jan van der Marwe um, some things that he researched. So Jan van der Marwe was born in 1963 in Tabazimli. He matriculated at Rodian High School, Swartrichens, in 1981 and completed all his degree studies at the RAU. Dr. Jan van der Marwe has a doctorate in anthropology, which he obtained in 2010 at the University of the Free State. And from 2007 to 2009, he was a board member of the Afrikaner Bruderbond. Dr. Van der Merwe is currently the chairman of the board of the Anglo World War Museum in Bloemfontein. Okay, Dr. Van der Merwe works full time as a researcher at the Manguan, Mango Wing Metro uh, Municipality in Bloemfontein. He pointed out that not only um, is it incumbent on a Mason to refrain from political, religious, or social discussion in a lodge but also to respect the government of the country in which he resides and to pledge himself not to take part in submers uh, subversive activities against that government. Uh, this was quite a problem in the, in, the, in the Boer War because of the English that participated in the, in the war and the Boers that were actually together free Masons and then um, so it was quite a, a catch-22 situation, yeah. A second negative reaction against Freemasonry, apart from that of the Dutch Reformed Church, before the start of the South African War came from uh, Rev. S. Jade Tour, the side of two Afrikaners, on April 15, 1876, the Tour wrote in the Patriot the following about the Freemasons to try to justify the secrecy aspect of society in the Patriot. He writes, Another peculiarity is the secrecy under which society operates. He quotes, at our second meeting, it was decided everyone agrees that we now have no other secret than to keep the names of the members dead silent. If one member reveals one secret, then the society can expel him. If one member wants to go out, then he must resign in writing, giving up the reasons why. But by signature, he remains bound to keep the secrets of society until his death. Of course, it is soon said history of the language movement um, thus becomes answer, but in their super, uh, superficiality, they lose sight of the fact that the society is directly opposite the Freemasons. For the Freemasons make their persons known, but their works remain secret, while the society publish all their works openly, but only does not want to put their persons in the foreground. 
Um, the society therefore acts completely in accordance with scripture, Matthew 5, 16, while the Freemasons are against scripture, John 3, verse 20 to 21. However, it seems that Freemasonry was a popular institution until the outbreak of the Southern uh, South African War, to which Boer leaders uh, belong, like belong as follows. Uh, so officers were Donny Tron, Pichabar, Pikrunia, Ben Pullin, Louis Boeta, Josie Smiths, Veja Lights, um, Sergeant Villanelle, JP Bessels, Ben Hovenga, Villa Boeta, Hobby van der Faust, SPA Eertrichard, Piet Visser, J.H. Oliver, and George Band. Then some presidents was M.W. Pretorius, Jan Ach E.W. Reitz, Franz Schalberger, uh, P.G. Blichnout, and Skulk Willem Berger, Stefanus Skuman, and Daniel Jacobus Erasmus. Then there was some uh, writers, like Celia Langenhoff and Afje Visser, Jan Hofmeier, Toon van den Jipper, Evie Reitz, uh, Adi Kiet, and O.O. Pinar. Then uh, one of the first presidents, Blackie Swart, Cornelius Vessels, and A.E.W. Rams Bottom, who were from the Free State, administrators from the Free State. Then some other popular Afrikaners was Colonel JCC Laws, um, Gustav Preller, uh, which was actually, uh, he was a, a writer for a paper as well, Tilman Ruiz, um, and also Gustav Preller was one of the first persons to write a story about the lost treasure. And then uh, obviously Cecil John Rhodes himself was also a Freemason. Um, yes. And that is about the list. So it looks like um, for some reason they decided that members of the Freemasons of the time was not um, allowed to be made public. So they wanted to keep it kind of secret. Okay, then in an article written by Angie Klein, she also says in the article, um, for more information, you can write, uh, you can go and have a look at the following books. I. A. Cooper's book, The Freemasons of South Africa in 1986, they're uh, given out by Human and Rousseau. O. H. Barter's book, The Lodge, The Good of Web in 1947, was given out by Strike. And then uh, the Cranstone's book, uh, The British Lodge Number 334. And then English Freemasonry at the Cape Kuda Web, 1795-1935. That was given out in 1936 by Collins Books. And she writes in her article um, After the martial law was promulgated in 1899, most of the Masonic lodges in the Boer Republic ceased operations, and many of the foreigners attached to the English lodges left the ZIR. The first battles of the English war took place on 20 October 1899 at Alana near Dundee. The fighting moved from here to Lady Smith where Commandant General Peter Bauer, a Freemason from the Bruder Lund Lodge in Pretoria, was involved. Uh, Jan van der Mavis says that the Boer forces never did any damage to any of the Masonic lodges in the war. The only recorded case of attempt damage by Boer warriors was in Dundee, where Boer rebels once tried to loot the furniture in a Masonic lodge. In the British publication Freemasons of July 1902, it's reported that the Boers safe buildings with more than one occasion of destruction with a recognized commitment to Freemasonry. Yet the British troops blamed them for vandalism and looting of Masonic buildings and many lodges uh, were also used by the British as hospitals, stores um, or offices. Cooperation according to Masonic policy, a member's first loyalty should be to other Masons. Boer explorer Captain Donny Tron, who was a member of the Krugersdorp Lodge, realized this well. He looted a train bound for Johannesburg and released 47 British prisoners at the request of fellow Freemason, Colonel J.G. Stuber. 
Stuart, the US Consul General in South Africa, was a passenger in the Trans Saloon car. The question is how the Masonic policy, according to which a member's first loyalty to other Masons should have affected the English war. There's apparently one thing that ever Boers and caucus on the battlefield of the war could say to recognize each other as Freemasons and escape death. And this was as follows. Oh Lord, my God, is there no help for the widow's son? According to Denise Woods, Freemasonry's main symbols were carved on this water bottle, the compass, drawing triangle, two pillars of bars and jacket, the Jashin, the all-seeing eye of Osiris, the sun, the moon, the checkered floor, a hammer, and a triangle with a ray sun behind it. And there you can also see all the symbols that we've discussed. This was used, and um, they found this on water bottles um, of some Boers. Jan Brandt was elected president of the Honest Tree State on 5 April 1865, and numerous lodges were opened of which those in Bloemfontein, Philippolis, uh, Winburg, Jagersfontein, Smithfield and Pittsburgh were among the first. Lodges were also established in the ZIR, where Freemason Martinez Vessel Pretorius was president. The first one, Flaming Star of Africa, was found 22 May 1865 in Port of Struem. Uh, the Scottish and British lodges said that new Dutch lodges were apparently established illegally. Okay, and that's it for today. So in the next video, we're going to have a look at Paul Kruger and some other relevant people um, to see if they were connected to Freemasonry. Until the next episode.